On April 11th, 1961, a monster was put on trial in the state of Israel and broadcasted to the world. The monster, who was housed in a glass box, was accused of crimes against humanity and the Jewish people, of knowingly sending hundreds of thousands of people to their deaths. When the trial commenced and the monster was asked how he pleaded, he answered, not guilty in the sense of the indictment. As the trial proceeded, the monster portrayed himself as a cog in a machine, a cog that was merely performing its duty. To some who observed the trial, the monster who sat before them appeared all too human. Behind the glass, there was no demonic essence of evil. The monster was, in fact, an average person, a normal person who was capable of committing terrifyingly evil acts. One observer went as far as to say that the manner in which the accused spoke and the way he framed his story was evidence that he simply lacked the ability to think. To this observer, it was no radical evildoer who sat in the glass box. His professed motives and his inability to avoid cliches were evidence of his banality. Hello and welcome to episode 111 of the Pan Psycast. I'm Jack Sives. I'm joined once again by Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome back Mr. Andrew Horton. Hello. How have you been, Andy? It's been far too long. I've been very well since we did the episode talking about the book. And that was back in October of 2021. Our book, by the way, which is still on Amazon. You can you can buy the book if that is <laughs> if that's what you're wishing to do. And yeah, it's it's really nice to be back. Uh, of course, the the topic that we're we're covering today kind of is one of those ones where I've known about Hannah Arendt for quite a long time. Of course, you can't not have heard about. Eichmann in Jerusalem and Jerusalem and her concept of the banality of evil, mm. if you've covered anything covering the Holocaust. So it was something that I was conscious of, but hadn't actually engaged with properly. I had never read through the entirety of Eichmann and Jerusalem. I'd used passages of it before mm -hmm. when talking about it in lessons. So it was actually, it was about time that I actually covered it properly. And I got a lot out of reading a lot of the biographies and, and the background work. There's so much scholarly work mm. on this book and on the work of Hannah Arendt. And while I'm sure that we'll be referencing it quite a bit, but Samantha Rose Hill, who is a an Arendt scholar and has, has is, a, is an authority on the life of mm. Arendt and her work, mm. we've all read her biography of the critical lives yeah, I learned a lot. Hannah Rent lived such a, an amazingly rich and interesting life mm. on the back that backdrop of the the horrors of the twentieth century. It was a fascinating read. Well, we should say, if you haven't guessed already, we're going to be discussing some sensitive content in this and in future installments of mm. this episode. We'll probably only touch on the surface in this installment because we're talking about Hannah Arendt's life. But in the next installment, part two, we're going to be talking about the trial itself, mm. and in part three, the essence of evil. And part four, further analysis and discussion. So there will be discussions of, of the Holocaust. We can't not discuss the Holocaust, given that's the, the topic of, of the book and the things Eichmann's been accused of um, being involved in when we get to the actual trial. We've also decided not to be so on the nose with jingles mm. that may be tone deaf. And that's something which Arendt was accused of with her own work. And so you might see a few changes in, in the presentation of the podcast. Yeah, we, we made a group decision on this that so much of the criticism that Arendt received after Eichmann in Jerusalem was about her tone, how the sort of a lack of, of respect for the victims. And while we're not going to have a deep dive on that right now at the beginning, uh, of course, we'll be talking about it in further analysis. But we did we did think that with, with so much of the way that we conduct the show in certain episodes, we can be quite irreverent. We we make silly comments, we have loads of little jingles, and it just didn't feel right given the context of yeah. what we're talking mm -hmm. about and the criticism that Arendt received. If we're going to criticize Arendt later in the episode, for us to be doing exactly the same thing seems mm. just, yeah, tone deaf in that, in that way. Rather than do an after show for patrons, we've just recorded a pre-show mm. and where we've all literally for the first time got around the table and discussed the moral and the pedagogical reasoning behind why we're doing certain things. But in a word, yes, the podcast is usually fun, but this topic isn't one which should be 
view through the lens of fun. Mm. And so we're, we're obviously going to be stripping back on on those things in particular. Ollie, it doesn't feel right to ask you whether you enjoyed your prep, but did you, is there anything in particular you thought was particularly interesting? Or did you get anything out of there in particular? Anything you're looking forward to hearing mine and Andy's thoughts on as well? Yeah, like Andy, I'd heard about the banality of evil before I read the book. I actually teach it. I use it as part of our part of the Holocaust curriculum that I teach at the school I work at. And I found the book really interesting. I found the work around the scholarship around this this book really interesting. And I think I've always been fascinated by the Holocaust and World War II anyway, just mm. from a history perspective more than a philosophical one, because it's obviously 20th century and we have so much documentation, the advent of photography and film. There is so much documentation of, of those events. And looking at the Holocaust and looking at the, the fallout of what happened after World War II, and especially fallout in regard to the Jewish people. It's really opened my eyes. I, I, I feel like I've just dipped my toe in an entire pool of academic thought that I've never really mm. considered before, especially from the Jewish perspective. And I, I'm really glad that we're looking at Hannah Arendt. She has a very, very large uh, breadth of work, and we're not going to be able to in any way be comprehensive with her today. We're going to give an introduction to one specific work of hers yeah. which sits in a context of other work like the origins of totalitarianism for example which is absolutely massive and you'd probably need five or six seven eight episodes to do that book justice to but i hope that this introduction to hannah Arendt, if you don't know who she is will be will be comprehensive enough that you might be curious to pick up some of the work and, and have a little look uh, yeah I, w I would agree I and mean, we, we cannot simply cover a lot of it and i, I actually thought yeah making the point about history is that while we are a philosophy podcast and and deeper into when we start talking about the concept of the banality of evil mm. uh, is when we might be able to start applying some of the tools of philosophy. But a lot of what we'll be talking about here isn't necessarily philosophical. I mean, we, you can always make it philosophical, but so much of it is the history of this woman's life in, in the context of what happened, how she experienced things and how she wrote about it. And then, of course, all of the, the history of of the victims of the Holocaust and how Eichmann came to be the person that he was. In that sense, then, this will probably be quite a lot different to, mm. to what we have mm. done in previous episodes. Perhaps philosophy can rightfully be accused of being overly abstract at times, but this certainly is not one of those cases. Yeah, that's something I took from the reading as well. Like Hannah Arendt's stress and the importance of not being an inward-looking philosopher, mm. contemplating ideas that aren't relevant to the world, but engaging with reality. And that requires the learning about the things that are going on around you. So yeah, I think there's loads of rich and interesting history that's important to study for the sake of itself that doesn't necessarily link to the philosophy in like a way that's necessary to discussing the ideas. You could probably pick up Eichmann in Jerusalem and read a chapter or two to be able to engage with the philosophy behind it. And we'll be doing that in the third installment. Mm. Yeah, For these first two installments, it'll be very much biography and history based. But I, for one, typically I'm not very interested in things outside of philosophy, but this I couldn't stop reading some of the books you both suggested to read for this episode. I teach this as an undergraduate module as part of a series of great philosophers and their like key ideas and the banality of evils one there. Mm. It's been great to look at the history behind those ideas rather than just take out the relevant quote and ask if it can be applied to things mm. and, and and whether or not this is a, a meaningful concept. So yeah, on on the point of all the reading and the approach that we're taking, I just wanted to to mention a couple of the books that mm. I've read in preparation for this because of course the the key texts Hannah Rents, Eichmann and Jerusalem and report on the banality of evil. And there is large chunks of that that are just a, an account of the historical aspects of, of the final solution. Mm -hmm. I, uh, in preparation for this, I've, I've read uh, not the entirety of the book because I didn't have time. I've read, read chapters of it that were particularly important for our discussion on um, Peter Hayes's why explaining the Holocaust. And that is, that's uh, just a a history book that answers big questions of the typical questions that teachers or academics receive when, mm. when trying to, to talk about the Holocaust. And so some of the chapters would be think like, so why the Jews? Why mm. Germany? Mm. Why why murder of the Jews and not uh, deportation? Mm. And that covers so much stuff that Arendt talks about. Um, I, I found it fascinating um, with all of the 
with the benefit of so much modern scholarship and so much time analyzing this, mm. I got a much bigger, uh, wider scope of what was happening in Germany at the time and not just through the lens of one individual. And the book that we all read and, and got a lot out of is Deborah Lipstad's The mm, Eichmann Trial, mm -hmm. which if I could recommend one book to pick up, if you if you want to know about the, the trial and and not just looking at a rent, I, I thought it was it was really insightful and gave a great look at it and uh she provides a, a, one of the last chapters of the book is a breakdown of what she thinks about a rent mm. so um it, i would pretty much if i if i was going to tell anybody who was going to read uh, eichmann in jerusalem by a rent is to pick this up as something to yeah, go definitely. with it yeah. yeah like it, it just complements the book so well mm. good. Uh, so that it's worth it's having just, even the history just missing from the text of rent is there isn't it in the, yes. in the backdrop yeah. and having that second voice to challenge some of the ideas that are in there. I thought that was that was really good. We're going to include links to all of the things mm. that we read or recommend on the website as always. And this is a topic again, as Ollie said, there's so much stuff beyond what we're going to be able to do in this introduction that if you want to go and learn more, you know where those sources are. Uh, one thing that I won't be linking on the website is the Hannah Arendt movie, which was recommended to me by Ollie, which might have been the worst thing. It's not that bad. Evidence of the banality of evil that I had to sit through an hour and a half of the banality of bad filmmaking. It was so bad. I mean, it's not exactly going to have like superheroes and explosions, uh, no, Mr. It's, Symes. It, it, I mean, it's, it's, it, I would say if, you've, if you're interested in the topic and you've researched a bit and you've done a bit of reading and it, yeah, it, it shows you a bit of Arendt's life, but it's literally a bunch of philosophers in rooms talking about ideas, which is not cinematically, in the language of cinema, not exactly the most exciting thing in the world. So if you're if you're into like a blockbuster, if you want something like Lord of the Rings, probably don't watch the Hannah Arendt movie. Yeah, it's, it's hard with a, with a film like that. You have a biopic that needs to cover certain ground in a particular way. And you can't do a lot of the whole show don't tell stuff because it, it is conversational. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think as as a film, it perhaps struggles at certain points. But I think after I watched it, it was it was the human side of Arendt that came through and her relationship with Heinrich Blücher, her her husband. It was based who, solely on kissing, think, one would gather from the I movie. they just had a loving relationship. <laughs> and so, I mean, me and Ollie, when we watched it, <laughs> I, I said, like, that was, for me, that was the thing that I got out of that um that film and and yeah okay um let's not dwell on this it's <laughs> worth a watch if you're really interested in a rent and the and the trial i think that's fair um but our telling of the tale will be twice as good so no need to rent the movie you can stick around here for the life of hannah Arendt. Part 1. The Life of Hannah Arendt So in this instalment, as we've said, we're going to be talking through the life of Hannah Arendt right from the beginning, right to the end. It's going to be comprehensive and way better than the movie. So Johanna Arendt was born in Landen, Hanover, Germany on October 14th, 1906. Her parents, Marta and Paul Arendt. Paul's an electrical engineer interested in Greek and Roman classics. A martyr had studied some French and music, and she was a private tutor and travelled abroad and such. They were quite like a left-leaning family, quite a, a well-off family as well. Religiously quite secular. She's Jewish. Yeah, I'm sure as we get into the further into our life that we'll talk about her relationship with Judaism. Because, as you just said there, her, her mother did not make a point in trying to raise her as specifically like orthodox jewish mm -hmm. and so she was part of a growing middle class intellectual jewish community who made a big point in, in this important to politically speaking of assimilating into the countries that they lived whether it's east prussia where they find themselves in, in Königsberg shortly, or in Germany as well. Mm. These were people who wanted to be Germans and not just Jewish. Um, their Jewish identity might have been very important to them, but they also belonged to a nation. It's really well documented, like Hannah Arendt's actual upbringing, because her mother, Marta, basically wrote a small book describing mm. all the things that happen to Hannah as she's growing up. She called it 
Our Child. It's about 71 pages long. And I just wanted to pick out one quote which really like touched my heart. I don't know if it did to you as well. I think uh, Samantha Rose Hill names one of her chapters maybe or there's a reference to this elsewhere. Uh, her mother writes, We saw her smile in the sixth week and observed a general inner awakening. And I thought that was just mm. a lovely way of like, nice describing that moment. It? Yeah, she also describes her as a sunshine child, doesn't she? And talks about how gifted she is even at a young age. She is born, though, into troubled circumstances regarding her father's health. So before they conceive with, with Hannah, it's knowledge in the family that Paul, her father, has syphilis. But he, they think it's like, it's not going to be a huge issue for him, that he's going to be able to live and be fine. But quite soon after, it looks like Paul's health's getting worse and they move to East Prussia looking for treatment for Paul syphilis. Well, they move back to Königsberg because that's where the uh, cones originate from and it's where they have a, a big tea trading business. So they have family and they have wealth back in Königsberg. So it seems like the natural place for them to return to look after. And Königsberg attracted many different Jewish families and refugees that came there and established themselves as either merchants, like we mentioned with, with the Cones at the moment, with like a tea business and, and lots of other industries as well. It was a really prosperous place with this growing secular Jewish middle class. Like any group of people, they want to hang around with and spend time with people that are similar to themselves. So mm. we have quite a, a prosperous Jewish community in Königsberg. And we have what becomes known as the secular Jewish Enlightenment, or known as Haskalah, um, led by many secular Jewish intellectuals that came from this this part of Europe, uh, which is quite interesting. We've also, obviously, today, Königsberg is not in it's not in Germany, it's in Russia, as far as a place called Kaliningrad, as far as I know today. Also, if you are aware from over our previous episodes, uh, Königsberg is also the place that Emmanuel Kant uh, famously walked around a lot, <laughs> which we'll mention at any possible opportunity. And this cultural atmosphere, lots of people say, really um, helped nurture Arendt's um, inquisitiveness and her intelligence, being around lots of people that are encouraging her to do the best that she can hmm. within Königsberg. Um, and even though that she takes the story takes a bit of a sad turn, unfortunately, with her father, it, it's very well documented that she was nurtured and, and looked after very well as a young child. So it's about two years after they move to Königsberg, and he's in nineteen eleven. He stops working as an engineer. He's placed in the mm. psychiatric hospital. He's suffering with dementia and with paralysis. And so Hannah's around seven when he died. So I think that's about nineteen thirteen when her father passes away. This is a time as we've mentioned in Königsberg and the and the Arendts more generally in terms of their religious beliefs Hannah was basically unaware that she was Jewish mm. she, she she knew she like she, she knew there was something different about it she describes and here's a quote from an interview she did in 1964 reflecting many years later on her childhood she says the word Jew never came up when I was a small child I first encountered it through anti-semitic remarks from children in the streets you see all Jewish children encountered anti-semitism and the souls of many children were poisoned by it the difference with me lay in the fact that my mother always insisted that I do not humble myself one must defend one oneself. Then a year after her father's death, the First World War began, and during the war, they actually have to flee the place that had only been there for, for a few years already. Yeah, they, they moved from Königsberg to Berlin for, for only 10 weeks. Now, of course, for a seven-year-old Hannah, I'm sure this would, would have been quite distressing mm. and it would have been difficult for her. But after 10 weeks, they realized that the, the Russians were not going to be invading Königsberg. So it, they felt it was safe to return. Mm. Yeah, and once they get back there, it seems from the descriptions I read that life was fairly normal for them then. She was able to, like the text say, turn inwards and start studying from her father's library. And her mum says, her mum writes, Hannah is a very good student, has ambition to be better than others. She learned Latin with her book according to her school's curriculum. Mm -hmm. She wrote the best exam on return to school when school eventually opens back up again. So apart from the inevitable economic depression which comes with war and things are going to get worse as we'll talk about in a moment, things carried on fairly normal for her despite the First World War and despite the death of her father, of course, big caveats there. And then in November 1918, of course, Germany signed the Armistice Agreement with the Allies and that ends the war. And this news, for, we don't want to go through a huge history of the First and Second World Wars, <laughs> But this shocked Germans at the time. They, they thought they were winning the war. And there's lots of things that are about to unfold in Germany. The loss of the war, the economic mm. depression that are going to put fuel on the fire of this existing anti-Semitism, which we've already encountered in Arendt's own biography. 
Yeah, I think it's fair to say the cultural atmosphere of Germany was very tumultuous after the end of World War One. Economic depression, large amounts of debt and money that the German government had to pay to the Allies afterwards, and just a sense of turmoil and uncertainty would be to be the weakest words I think you could use to describe it. Mm. Obviously, we, we're not going to spend hours talking about the economic impact on each individual family within Germany. That backdrop is really useful in seeing how Arendt's thinking develops. It's quite interesting, actually. I, I love that at this point as well, she starts becoming a little bit more rebellious, that she definitely doesn't just think what everybody else thinks just because it's, you know, the spirit of the time. It's actually a story of her at school. This rebellious attitude gets quite extreme and she actually ends up being expelled for organising a boycott of one of her classes and ganging a bunch of students up against a specific teacher. Quite organised, right, um, for a young girl. <laughs> uh, and obviously, you know, we, we've mentioned that she's quite academically gifted. She clearly has a bit of contempt there for the for the academic system that she's stuck in. Uh, her mother tries to reason with the principal to have a stay in school, um, but eventually because of many disruptions and missing a lot of classes, uh, Marta actually arranges for her to move to the University of Berlin. And at 15, she moves into a student boarding house there and attends classes in Greek, Latin and philosophy there as well. I just want to introduce a couple of, or well, one's definitely my favourite character of the story before we ship her off to university and kick her out of the school. So in 1920, her mother remarries a widowed businessman and he's got two daughters of his own, uh, Eva and Clara. They're quite sensible, they're quite quiet and Arendt's, obviously from Ollie's description, they're very different to these mm. two young studious women and Arendt's not turning up to school much. Uh, apparently there's a quote somewhere like she needs like three cups of coffee to go <laughs> up in the morning. You sympathise with that, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't have, she has, she makes very little effort as well to become a part of this new family. But one person she really wants to connect with is Anne Mendelssohn, descendant of the rock star of the Haskalah and the Jewish Enlightenment, <laughs> as Ollie's just mentioned, Moses Mendelssohn. He's the, the champion of secularizing Judaism, integrating the Jewish people into the existing nation states that is Europe. And Anne becomes basically a best friend at this time, right? She's She confines in her things she doesn't speak to other people about. Mm. They go out partying, they sneak out of the house. Yeah. Anne's dad's done some dreadful things, so uh, Marta doesn't want yeah. Hannah hanging out with Anne, but she does it anyway, and eventually she becomes accustomed to it. And they, they, as far as I am aware, I can't remember exactly at which points they, they obviously lose touch a little bit, but they are, mm. they are, do remain friends for, throughout their lifetimes. Mm. Yeah, it's it's interesting that she she finds somebody like her in a way, and and one thing that seems really clear when I was reading through. All the, both of the biographies I read is that Hannah Arendt had very close, very good connections with mm. certain individual people that that did remain with her uh, for as long as she could could hold on to them. Mm. So once she finishes basically being in a boarding school, so she can finish her secondary school education, as it were, she joins the University of Marburg in 1924, just before her 18th birthday, where she studied under the hugely influential, even at the time, the exceptionally prominent philosopher, Martin Heidegger. We've mentioned him a couple of times on the show, but never dedicated an episode to him. And we're not going to here either. Mm. But yeah, he's 36 years old. He's married. He's got two sons. He's quite a handsome chap from the accounts, which, which I read. He had a cool mustache and... <laughs> Hannah was not just blown away by his handsomeness, but his intellect as well. Yeah, I, I think the impression that you get from from the biographies is that he was quite charismatic. He was very intelligent. His students seemed to be in awe of how he taught, hmm. uh, that they would latch on to his words. And what he said had a profound impact, not just on Hannah Arendt, but on the people who worked closely with him. Hmm. So whatever we can say about about him later, clearly the people who who were capable of, of engaging with his ideas, he seemed to inspire deeply. Of course, it seems that with anything that is really abstract as I suspected there were some people who struggled a lot with what he was trying to teach and probably gave up on it but for those like Hannah Arendt who had a, already had a bit of a training in philosophical works we said that she used her father's library as a child and, mm. and had already engaged in some quite difficult philosophical texts yeah. that I suspect meeting a man like Heidegger uh, at the age of 18 
was probably very inspiring and something that she would want to to pursue and and of course she did continue to engage in philosophy and some theology as well as she progressed in her academic career for the next decade yeah as as a kid before she even turns up to university she's reading the critique of pure reason she's reading Karl Jaspers who she'll later go on and work with as well she starts to form a relationship with Heidegger from the get-go at joining the university they would hide their relationship from Heidegger's wife so the teacher in in Heidegger's office in the privacy of her attic apartment and going for long walks in the woods I think they portray that in the in the movie as well and then walking through the woods mm, and yeah. saying some <laughs> sorry I won't get home from the movie that's the last mention <laughs> of the movie I'll mention but what I do want to mention is she had a she had a pet mouse at this time which these two seem to I've mentioned this off microphone twice now I can't believe that didn't just, jump back that did, that did not that was not the pet take away for me common at the time as it happened well, it, Jack, well uh, Rose Hill Samantha Rose Hill says that Heidegger was quite attracted to a childishness this childish nature and she had a pet mouse in her attic and she would <laughs> are we just gonna let that fly <laughs> yeah. that's not creepy at all but okay carry on <laughs> and she would lure this mouse out with cheese when her friends would come around actually right you know what N- now you're saying that that little element about the cheese has now made me remember not important <laughs> though um yeah the 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 affair here was understandably secretive he's a 35 year old university professor he's working on what eventually will become his big work of Mm. being in time and and that he cannot be seen to be having an affair now of course later down the line as we we approach 1933 which is when he officially becomes a nazi party member is that it takes on an extra layer which is that of course if he had been seen having an affair with a jew Mm. that that this would have much more damaging effects to his career and his position as being a Nazi. He presumably was prepared to take that risk with a rent. From what I understand is that that would certainly have been the first affair that he had had, but later down the line he would have engaged in other affairs with with presumably other students. As Mm. we approach 1933 and Heidegger obviously becoming a Nazi, and we'll talk about like how what the evidence for that is and how public he was about it. Before leading up to that, Arendt described like an unbridgeable gap between them, how how he could put his work first and didn't have the time mm. basically for having that relationship with Arendt that she wanted. So after a year at Marburg and obviously her work there studying philosophy, classical languages and Protestant theology, she then moves to Freiburg University for a short time to study with another big thinker in German philosophy, Edmund Herzl, and from there to the University of Heidelberg, where she completes her degree with a very another, another influential thinker, Karl Jaspers in 1929. I think it's worth mentioning that in about three, four years, Hannah Arendt has studied with some of the most prominent yeah. and important philosophers of not just not just German philosophy, but like philosophy of the 20th century. Like if you go and look up these names, they are big thinkers. They are and really influential in lots of different schools of philosophy from things like existentialism to, to other forms as well. So she's getting a really wonderful education at this point and being introduced to lots and lots of different ideas. It's interesting. Her dissertation at this time when she she does hands it in at uh, the University of Heidelberg, it's uh, Love and Augustine she focuses on. Hmm. And when it eventually gets published, people are quite critical that she doesn't engage in the Christian history and the theology to the extent they would have liked with the title like Love and Augustine. But she receives, quote, full marks for originality and spirit. No surprise there, given the, the intelligence of the people mm. she's worked with. Yeah, okay, but just, I don't want to dwell on this point because it's not really the point of, of what we're discussing today. But it's interesting how much Augustine spoke to a certain type of intellectual at the time because uh, he was a thinker that seemed to influence the whole existential mm. movement. Because we know that when we looked at Camus, that he, he obviously worked on Augustine as well, um, and that some of Augustine's ideas come through in his novels as well as his philosophical writing and here again we've got augustine influencing people like heidegger as well as arendt and and Mm. jaspers and everybody Mm. seems to be engaging with this very fundamental and critical christian theologian and philosopher clearly there's something there Mm. that that inspires these people and whether it's the the, sorry and the point there being is that whether it's the christianity bit that is super important to them or something else that he's getting to Mm -hmm. I think it's worth mentioning as well that I work with Carl Jaspers. Carl Jaspers becomes one of her dearest and closest friends throughout pretty much the rest of his life. They are not just teacher and student. They have a very, very intimate friendship. And a lot of their letters between each other are are really personal in terms of 
Jasper's really nurtures her and they and then they become almost equals right in terms of their development of her thinking with in conversation with Carl Jaspers and even when later on when she's facing really really harsh criticisms from many close friends and academic colleagues Jaspers is always on her side and and always trying to promote her mm. ideas and very interesting as well in terms of where her philosophical ideas go we've got her studying under Martin Heidegger who understands philosophy as a very solitary enterprise right to quote Samantha Rose Hill and then Jaspers is almost the complete opposite of philosophy being something that needs to be engaged with the world you know for him philosophy was about lived experience he was a psychiatrist he was interested in psychology and scientific knowledge and how how philosophy can quite a bit too cheesy about it but like you know change the world and have a big impact on people's lives and we can see that having a big impact on some of Arendt's own ideas later on in her career yeah I was, I was gonna say the one of the things that I had re read around of Arendt before approaching this was her understanding of the conscience and the two-in-one dialogue mm -hmm. and she talks about a reflection on on some of the work of Plato and Socrates and, and, and Socrates sort of wrestling with his inner demon, this, this inner voice that he has. And that is such a, a prominent theme of Arendt's mm. work. If you, if you read any of these bios or some of the stuff, like it just keeps coming up two in one conversation. So it's fantastic that you can see that this, this early influence of Carl Jaspers is yeah. clearly stuck with her throughout her life. Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all our patrons for making the show possible. In particular, a very special thank you to Mr. Adam Cool, Mr. T, Brian Ramirez, Miss Lily Hooper, Andrew Cherryman, Pedro, and St. David Ligeness. If you, dear listener, want to help support our show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. Right, let's jump back into the discussion. We're still in that, but lack of a better way of putting it, that two-in-one stage of a life as well, aren't we? Where she's taking herself away from the world as it is. So think about when you go and read a book or think through an idea, you take yourself off on your own. And it's like having a conversation with yourself. And then when you go out into the world and see people like I am now, I become one and I act as one rather than two-in-one. Mm. So at this point of life, she's living that contemplative side in that she's not yet going to be the political theorist and that active proponent of, of anti-authoritarian views that she's later well known for. At this stage, she's still very much in that early contemplative st studying stage. I want to jump us to 1933. Just, just before we do, so what I'd like to to, to really too, because 1933 is such a big year, of mm. course, for Germany and the Nazi party. Quick little bit of preempt to this. So when Hannah Arendt goes in 1924 to study at university mm -hmm. under Heidegger is that we already a year before that have a, a very important event that happens in in the history of the Nazi party, which is the Beer Hall puts, which is a, a basically a coup that mm -hmm. Hitler wants to inspire to, to, mm -hmm. to overthrow the government. And of course that fails and Hitler is tried and, and is accused of treason. Now he's sent to prison, what was supposed to be a sentence of five years and would turn out to be considerably shorter than that. Uh, but during that time, he wrote Mein Kampf. Mm -hmm. And this is the start in, in early of the in the 1920s of the Nazis really beginning to, to build influence and power. Mm -hmm. And yes, while it would take until 1930 when they would win only 18% of the seats in parliament, and then a year later they would they would go up as far as 37%. You can see that during all this time in university, there would have been a growing sense of certain areas of, of Germany of anti-Semitism becoming normalized yeah. and that mm. Hitler and the Nazi party are using this. When we get to 1933 then, this is already when the Nazis have effectively taken control of parliament and they've been voted in mm. by the people of Germany. But then we have, well, we'll talk about it in a minute, but of course that the burning of the, the Reichstag mm. building yeah. was monumental for them changing a law that allowed Hitler to eventually become the supreme authority mm. in Germany that would allow him to have the type of control that would lead to, to the later events. So 1929 is not just an important year because it's when Hannah Arendt graduates university. It's also the year she gets married. I'm hearing wedding bells, fellas. So in January of 1929, she meets Gunther Anders or Gunther Stern at a New Year's masquerade ball in Berlin. And it was quite a romantic meeting here. Very Anders is described as being very dashing, swarthy, gentleman. Arendt was actually dressed as a haram girl in an Arabian garb, so probably wouldn't fit with some of the cultural appropriation stuff of today. Um, but they meet, they hit it off um, quite immediately. They end up moving in together after a month of dating. Do you have the 
his pickup line, which he approached her with. I can't remember. Uh, I don't have the pickup line. So he writes this after Hannah oh, passes yeah. away okay. later in life. Yeah. I won Hannah at a ball while dancing. I remarked that love is the act in which one transforms an a posteriori into the a priori <laughs> of one's own life. <laughs> lame <laughs> <laughs> oh, that should never work for anyone <laughs> uh, so they moved in together after around a month and in september they they end up uh, getting married i think it's worth mentioning in, in the grand scheme of arendt's life this this relationship is often overlooked i think but i think it's worth saying that her relationship with 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 gunter stern has this they, they write together they co-author articles together he introduced her to some of the more marxist ideas that he's interested in as well because of him she starts reading things like Karl marx and leon trotsky and obviously that work is going to be really, really important for her, her thinking later on. And that this relationship starts off, it seems to be, in a really positive manner. Both quite young, they're both very into philosophy, as you can tell from that pickup line. I mean, crikey, that wouldn't work <laughs> on work the average way. person. Can you imagine? <laughs> um, so this relationship starts off very positive, and in the, uh, the late the late 20s, early 30s, it seems that their relationship is is going well. Yeah, I mean, on, on the sorry, quickly on the on that pickup line, I guess you you could you could uh, you could make you could make it more romantic, can you, by just changing the language slightly? So yeah, like maybe, all maybe, of it? maybe it maybe it translated better in German. Who knows? Um, <laughs> Um, but no, on the on the on the point of of Anders is that he he was clearly a sharp intellect, although he, he did have a run in with Heidegger, who accused him of of piracy. What's the word I'm looking for? Plagiarism. Plagiarism. No, plagiarism sorry. Yeah. Um, for, for yeah, for, for effectively stealing his ideas and passing them off as his own. So he was he wasn't popular with with Heidegger. Mm. He was, however, popular with Marta, which is interesting because, of course, later on is that she would not be such a fan of Heinrich Blücher, Hannah's long standing husband. And, mm. and presumably the love of her life um, and they they had a bit of friction um, whereas with Anders I think he seemed to be because he was part of a certain type of social class mm -hmm. and very similar to them in that way that she warmed to him more than Blücher uh, just final bit on Anders is that I don't think he was known for any particular intellectual writing as such mm -hmm. in that uh, I'm sure lots of his articles and stuff still exist but he did he was writing a novel that was supposed to be a dystopian book that was uh probably for the readers at the time a not so subtle dig at the totalitarian regimes mm. and and they had to hide that and make sure that that wasn't caught mm. and that was apparently I don't know the name of the director but somebody adapted that into a movie in 2012 Oh, it, well. it had been, do, you, do you know what it's called? No, I don't. I can't remember. I just remember that that little tidbit, and I thought that that's, that's what, a, what a deep yeah. cut. Yeah. Somebody, somebody <laughs> going back to that in yeah. 2012. Interesting. <laughs> so just to just to give a, the context before we proceed to move on with Hannah Arendt's life, in 1928, we had the Wall Street stock market collapse, and so we have a huge uh, depression, hyperinflation in Germany. And by 1930, as Andrew said, two million Germans had lost their jobs. And said, when does Hitler is appointed chancellor in 1933? And so in 1933, pretty pretty shortly after he's elected, is the burning of the Reichstag. Mm -hmm. So the Reichstag starts burned down. And Hannah Arendt says, and she writes, from that moment on, I felt responsible. That is, I was no longer of the option that one can simply be a bystander. And at the same time, Heidegger's coming out as a Nazi too around the same time as Hitler's appointed chancellor. Yeah, and uh, for the, for those of you who might not be as familiar with the history here, the burning of the Reichstag building, because it was you know, the parliamentary building, this was blamed, and from what I've read about this, historians have generally uh, have a consensus that the person who did start the fire was a communist. Mm. But, of course, what the Nazi party did was use this as, as an opportunity using very effective propaganda was to then say well we need to go after all of the communists and certain types of intellectuals in germany and so this caused a lot of panic amongst a lot of the people that hannah arendt would have spent some mm. time with given the fact that we've already said that her husband is a communist yeah and so gunter anders or gunter stern makes the decision as well as many other left-leaning thinkers to flee mm. and to, mm -hmm. to get out of Germany as quickly as possible. So Arendt's obviously upset with Heidegger following her departure from the university, but when he comes out essentially and joins the Socialist Party, identifies himself as a Nazi, he's elected rector of the University of Freiburg in 1933, and he's 
signed a, an order to dismiss all faculty who aren't of Aryan descent, including his own mentor, Edmund Husserl. Mm. And in later years, Heidegger becomes critical of the regime, so much so that in 1944, the Nazis send him off to dig trenches because he became critical towards the end mm. of the war. And we'll see them re-encounter later on in the story, but I think it's about 17 years of silence between them. Mm. I guess let's leave that story there until they're reconnected 17 years in the future. So over time, Hannah's then wife, Gunther, finds himself in her shadow. She surpassed him intellectually, and his ego didn't seem to appreciate this. And he didn't approve of Hannah's, quote, masculine behavior. He didn't think she should be smoking cigars and staying up late with her male friends, such as Kurt Blumenfeld. Blumenfeld's a significant Zionist. We should say what Zionism is before we proceed. Sure. So Zionism is an idea that's been around for a very, very long time. And it's connected to the idea of a formation of a separate homeland for the Jewish people. I often feel like if we're talking about it in the perspective from 2022, mm -hmm. if you use the word Zionism, I think think it doesn't always kind of generate the most positive ideas but at this time we've got to remember we have the jewish diaspora so the idea that the jewish people would have no current homeland at the moment and many jewish thinkers at the time are interested in this idea as a, a solution to the anti-semitism that they are facing mm -hmm. jewish people all over europe in in, the, in in england it'd be france germany suffer anti-semitism hannah arendt herself has mentioned it like we did at the start of the episode that's something she's experienced and one of the solutions to that is to find a homeland or a state that the jewish people can have for themselves mm -hmm. and that will be one of the solutions to the, the problems that they're facing uh, with anti-semitism yeah just the when i was reading background stuff there i mean the the context matters a lot because there were a lot of the areas in which many jews found themselves and situated themselves in europe uh, had laws that prevented jews from being able to to have certain jobs in fact they were pretty much told that you can only work in certain areas mm -hmm. and that they were always seen as pariahs outsiders mm. and they were allowed to live in places with the occasional like pogrom that would, would result in Jews being assaulted and whatnot. It's not until quite late that the like the emancipation of the Jewish people starts happening across Europe, mm -hmm. not, not instantly, not across all of Europe at the same time. Um, and that Jewish people begin this, what we described earlier of assimilating into the cultures they mm -hmm. find themselves in. So for a, for a lot of, of the Jews in Europe, the idea of Zionism would make a lot of sense because mm. they would have felt like they were outsiders, that they didn't belong to the nation states that they were in, and so wanted to politically organize in a way that would actually give them grounds to, to be able to make their own laws and to protect themselves and not just suffer at the whim of whatever nation state decides mm. they want to do with this group of people. So in that context, Zionism makes an awful lot of sense to me in that they wanted to represent themselves and protect themselves and to have their own rights. Yeah, and maybe we've not emphasized the darker side of this anti-Semitism. We're talking, you know, there's stories of in the 1600s in the UK, for example, in York, hundreds of Jews were hoarded into a, a castle and the castle was burned and they all they all died uh, many jewish people were blamed for the uh, crucifixion of jesus and were referred to as christ killers and that was used as a, a slur and uh you know and people treat horribly andy mentioned like le literal legislation against people meaning they, they couldn't do certain types of work for example and they were restricted in certain industries or not hired for work at all for being jewish if you ever have time to go and research the history of anti-semitism it's very very long and there's lots of horrific examples of how bad it was for many Jewish people in Europe. You don't need the the paint by numbers explanation of how this content is relevant today, right? But Arendt's concern here is that the nation state sees itself as one nation, either as a sense of nationalism and who are the true inhabitants of that land, and the state which protects the rights of people who live within those borders. And what she found is that the nation side of the Jewish people considering to be other, considered to be not the true inheritors of this piece of land who should be defended mm -hmm. as the others. So she essentially wants a Zionist movement of the Jewish people ought to just have their own homeland in its simplest form mm. for political reasons in that it only really matters if you've got someone to defend your rights, i.e. a state to defend your rights. And that's what she wanted. And you can mm. see why as we progress into what happens to, to the Jews with forced emigration and even just push like gentle forced emigration as we're about to see. Shall we mention then, this seems like an important point to mention the Nuremberg laws in 1935. They seem pivotal in understanding what the place of the Jews is going to be around this period. 
So in 1935, the Nazi Party's been in power for several years now, and it starts implementing laws called the Nuremberg Laws, which are laws which discriminate against the Jewish people. Now, I think often when we think of the Holocaust and we think of World War II, obviously with hindsight, it's it's very easy to see where it's going. But we've got to remember for people at the time, they had no idea of where, how bad, quote unquote, it would get. So this starts off with what we would call just restrictions on what Jewish people can do. So it would start off with very, very simple things saying that you Jewish people, for example, there's certain people they can't marry or there's certain uh, op- occupations or jobs they can't have and then obviously as we as we go through the years through the 1930s these get and 40s these get worse and more restrictive jewish people being having their property stolen from them being taken away jewish people being scapegoated for lots of different things in society lots of the problems especially with the economy are com- is completely blamed on the jewish population they're stereotyped as being greedy uh, and this stereotype is kind of emphasized by the fact that a lot of the work they do, we mentioned that Hannah Arendt's family comes from uh, like tea, a tea business. A lot of their own businesses are very visible, so they're very easy to blame for that. And people kind of embrace these stereotypes. Lots of um, what we would call cons- modern day conspiracy theories as well. The idea that there is a cabal of Jewish people that run society and are siphoning money away from the government and keeping Germany weak. Like we say, that this starts with then them not just having the rights taken away, but then being forced out of their homes and eventually into places like ghettos where they're gathered together with their property taken away, all of their rights taken away. They're pretty much reduced to just being animals, really, the way we would treat animals. And then eventually we get to the concentration camps later. So that begins with the Nuremberg Laws. Mm. And Hannah Arendt can see this happening. She can see that the rights of Jewish people are being taken away. Her herself, as an academic, is really struggling to be able to find work. And she can see the kind of tide of society turning in a really negative direction. So it was her friend, the Zionist Kurt Blumenfeld, who encouraged her to engage in some research. She was looking for materials of professional clubs and organizations within Germany trying to find examples of anti-Semitic remarks. The intention there was to send that to news outlets and governments around the world to show them what was happening within Germany at the time. So she was going to this local library over and over again to find uh, this information. And then one day, there's a Nazi law called the Horror Propaganda Law. So you're not allowed to be researching the, the Nazis or disseminating evidence or disseminating ideas that is anti-Nazi. So she's leaving the library one day. The librarian had reported her to the Gestapo and she's leaving. The police officer grabs her and says, there's a quote somewhere where she quotes him as saying, what does an, an academic like you need with all these newspapers? He takes her to the police station. He's super nice to her. They seem to have got on really well. She's <laughs> she, she's incredibly friendly. Is the like, She seems to have so easily is able to engage with people around. She, this police officer stops on the way to the police station to buy a cigarettes. They're chatting, they're having a nice time. He says, like, I got you in here. I'll make sure I get you out of here. There's a really funny part where they send the Gestapo around to the house to look at the materials she's got, look at her notebooks and research, and they come back and uh, they have her notes, which are quoting uh, Samantha Rose Hill, asking her if it was some kind of secret code. She tried to explain to them that it was Greek. <laughs> I thought it's hilarious. <laughs> they were just like, just trying to find anything they could. But after eight days, in her own words, because I'd made friends with the official who arrested me, he was a charming fellow. And the night of her release was, according to Anne Mendelssohn, the most drunken occasion of their lives. And the next day, Arendt disappears with her mother, they make their way out of out of Prussia, and they find she finds herself, Hannah Arendt does in Paris. So we now find Hannah Arendt in Paris. And while she's in Paris, she starts working for a first a formal Zionist organization. She's really shook by her experience in Nazi Germany of anti-Semitism, and she wants to help. How is she going to help? Well, this organization that she's working for is helping to send Jewish orphans to Palestine, which is currently under British control, and especially vulnerable orphans in places like Austria and Czechoslovakia. She's helping get those people away from this horrific anti-Semitism that's happening. And obviously, she's a prominent member of the Jewish community there in Paris. She she starts integrating herself very well into some academic circles and comes into contact with Walter Benjamin and Heinrich Blücher and eventually becomes kind of involved with the German Communist Party. So we've mentioned Heinrich Blücher already. He would eventually become her husband and the love of the, the rest of her life. And while he was an academic, he did not share the same education that her and Anders had He did not go on to write any academic work or anything like that, but presumably would have aided her in her writing and and would have read any transcripts and stuff that that she had produced. 
it's a good job something else didn't work out or she wouldn't have met Blücher in 1934 after only been in Paris for a short time she actually asked for help from the Academic Assistance Council and she listed her countries where she wanted to go to as England, mm. USA and Palestine and she nearly went to the London School of Economics but the offer never came through so she stayed in Paris and she meets Blücher in 1936 at a public lecture and this this period of time seems quite stable for them she's she's helping out with Jewish organizations she's in a thriving intellectual community with Sartre and Lacan and Merlin Ponty and then in 1939 Nazi Germany invade Poland and leading up to this preparation essentially the French authorities begin building internment detention camps for refugees and expelling Jewish people who don't have work permits so it quickly turns sour as that that wave of anti-Semitism continues to slowly creep over Europe. Yeah, so the French government begin to round up what they call, quote, enemy aliens. And although she's been stripped of her German citizenship in 1937, Arendt did fall into this category of an enemy alien, was sent to a camp in a place called Gers in the southwest of France, mm. originally set up to hold Republican refugees from Spain. And Blücher's actually sent to a separate camp near Paris, so she's separated from Blücher. There is, I think in a lot of the literature you can see, they, there's definitely, that Arendt was aware of the irony here, that she is to escape imprisonment in Germany, gets to France, to what's supposed to be safety and then ends up in an internment camp. Mm. Hannah Schramm describes the women living in Gers as looking like ghosts, confused and bewildered in an unfamiliar world, uh, that there was mud, pollution, lack of mm. shelter, food, the conditions were horrendous, and that she arrived there with 2,364 women and that by uh, the kind of next few months it had almost doubled, so it's crammed as well. And uh, even, uh, Hannah Arendt does try to do her best in this situation. She's helping discuss English lessons for those there and helping like educate people in philosophy. But I think we can all agree that the uh, situation she's in is pretty grim. By 1941, so a couple of years after her arrival there, there was 15,000 people. And we'll talk about Adolf Eichmann in our next installment of the podcast. But he essentially sends the people from that camp to Auschwitz, mm. who, were, who were then murdered upon their arrival. And... When it eventually was to close, because in 1943, there was only around 1,200 people there. Our first insight there into the, the ruthlessness of, mm. of the, the Nazi regime when the final solutions eventually implemented. Mm. But a few weeks, and this is Arendt's own words, a few weeks after our arrival in the camp, France was defeated and all communications broke down. In the resulting chaos, we succeeded in getting hold of liberation papers with which we were able to leave the camp. And about 200 women of the total 7,000 left. She then hitchhikes and walks to a meeting point for, for refugees. And it's here where she's looking for, for Blucher wherever she can. And apparently they just bump into each, each other. other. Yeah, yeah I found that almost unbelievable when, yeah. when I was reading that. that uh, they must have, must have been at least looking for one another. Sure. And because this was the place that they would likely end up, that it seems possible that if that you were looking happen. for her you just go wherever they sold cigarettes yes, and you just yes. wait outside there until she eventually turned up so they find each other they rent like a small apartment a photographer's studio and start looking for exit papers they need to get out of europe as quickly as they can and with the help of very and fry the head of the emergency rescue committee they managed to get papers for the usa and fry saves like two thousand people in this 12 13 month period it's phenomenal how many lives he He's responsible for saving. And then in 1941, the USA tightened its entry policy. There's like 1,200 or so names submitted for mm. people who want to get to the USA from Europe between August and December of yeah. that year. And, and only, only, yeah, only 238 received emergency visas. So like, yeah. we're talking luck there. So she's 35 when she gets on the ship to New York. There's two world wars she's fled from. She's been arrested by the Gestapo. She's been in the internment camp. She just bumps into Blue Cron the street and she's one of the very few people to actually get a visa over to the USA. And she gets out pretty much just in time by the skin of her teeth. If you look at what eventually happens to France and, yeah. you know, the, as the war continues, uh, the fact that she escapes is almost miraculous. She's literally one of the last to go. Um, and that's just when you think about all of the, like you said, all of the events, she's just managed to escape harm so far. It's almost unbelievable how lucky she was in that situation as well. So Hannah Arendt arrives in New York and another very famous friend, Paul Tillich, finds her work as a housekeeper and she spends her time learning English, reading, studying, going for walks, basically not doing any housekeeping. 
She also has a buzzing social life in New York. She makes loads of friends and with lots of them with common interests. Yeah, she she finds, uh, as you would expect, a, a growing Jewish community, people who have made the journey like her to safety and to, and to reside in New York. And she does work, continues to work with certain Zionist ideas, as well as just helping people who are refugees. It becomes a big part of her life. I just really thought I'd just really quickly, I think that's the only time it's going to come up. She found the, the idea of the American constitution to be pretty much her, her perfect idea of, of what mm. a state, at least at the time, could be. The fact that she's having to flee a country that is is basing its entire identity around mm. the idea of certain ideas of race and yeah. and blood and whatnot, and that she moves to America and at least the promise is that all, all people remain equal under the law and this is enshrined in the constitution mm. um she, she thought that and she would eventually go on to become an american citizen in august of 1941 she attends a lecture by kurt blumenfeld and this lecture is literally called should the jews have an army and this is a really inspiring lecture for hannah Arendt. we've mentioned that new york was relatively welcoming to refugees and that this community is quite buzzing and that actually as part of witnessing that lecture Arendt gets inspired and what she she does is she decides to write a letter to an editor called Manfred George of a specific paper. And she wants to support the idea of helping the Jewish people as much as possible. Manfred George, this editor, is so impressed with her letter that she writes him that he actually gives her a weekly column in his paper called This Means You. And she used this column to argue for the formation of a Jewish army to defend the Jewish people. It was only a few months later in December of 1941 when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, dragging the USA into the war. And that year, news of the final solution had reached New York. And Hannah writes the following her, her immediate reaction. We who are alive have to learn that you can't live on your knees, that you don't become immortal by chasing afterlife, and that if you are no longer willing to die for anything, you will die for having done nothing. And this connects to what her mother essentially said with growing up, you defend yourself as a Jew and what, exactly what Ollie's just said there is in a Jewish army to defend the rights of Jews. Now, in our next installment, we're going to be talking about a lot of the things that happened during the war, particularly in relation to the final solution. But for now, we suffice it to say that the German forces surrender in May of 1945. And she spends that summer working on her magnum opus, The Origins of Totalitarianism. She then takes her first teaching position in that same year at the Graduate Division of Brooklyn College. And then three years later, as we wind towards the end of Hannah Arendt's life, Hannah's mother had actually joined them in New York a few weeks after Hannah and Blucher had got there themselves. And her mother decides that she's going to move to England to be with Hannah's stepsister, Eva. Her other stepsister, Clara, had passed away in 1932, suffering with that severe mental health. So Hannah's mum gets on the ship, the Queen Mary, to go to England. And then Hannah takes her to the ship and she apparently she wasn't getting on with Blucher anyway, mm -hmm. Hannah's, Hannah's mum. And when she gets back, comes home to a telegram which reveals that her mum had passed away mm -hmm. during the trip from, a, from an asthma attack. So she dies at 74 years old, her mother. Off the back of this, Hannah returns to Europe in 1949 as executive director of the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Commission. Do we say what this is, why it's important? So for those of you who aren't aware, during the Holocaust, lots of Jewish artifacts were taken and stolen from the Jewish people. And that could be anything from their physical clothing, things like glasses, to their money, property, etc. And there is a worry and a concern that all of this is going to remain lost. Mm. So Hannah Arendt, along with many other Jewish people, helped to try and recover as many physical artifacts so that could be physical possessions but also academic work and think of all of the the books and literature um, uniquely connected to a population of people that could be lost uh, and apparently in germany during several trips she was able to recover over fifteen thousand books of is that right it sounds about right sounds like a lot she did a lot Fifteen thousand books of, uh, of hebrew and jewish culture Ca uh, countless ritual and artistic artifacts so that could include like literally whether it's mm. like copies of the torah things like you know the artifacts you'd find in a synagogue etc uh, and more than a thousand scrolls of law so whatever criticisms come hannah arendt's way later on when we talk about the controversy with the banality of evil i think it is 
definitely worth saying that she was very interested in preserving Jewish culture and caring for it. When she was there in Europe, she reconnects with Heidegger, what seems at the very last moment. It's unclear who reached out to who, but essentially he turns up. They spend a couple of nights together. It seems to have been inferred from the biographies that I read that they essentially slept together again. And and that was fine for Blücher and her because they had never agreed on monogamy for their relationship in the first place. There's some great quotes where they they talk about how if only everyone could see this is what marriage is really like, unconditional love. And like, how, how great would the world be? She says of that night, two nights with Heidegger, it was confirmation of an entire life. And she thinks about dedicating future books to Heidegger later on. In fact, in one of the written manuscripts for her book, The Life of the Mind, there's a little note in the archives, which is still available, where she writes, the dedication of this book is omitted. How can I dedicate it to you, trusted one, whom I was faithful and not faithful to, and both with love? I'd say that she loved him unconditionally. She loved him no matter what. She was faithful and not faithful to, but she wasn't faithful to him out of love because he betrayed himself in, in the moral sense. Moving a few years later, we then have news of Eichmann being captured. We're going to be talking about that in the next installment in 1960 of the summer. And Hannah Arendt goes to Jerusalem to report on the trial in April of 1961. When she returns home in the autumn of 1961, Blue could suffered from an aneurysm and it's, his health starts to deteriorate. Then he has a brief spell where he's okay and he's able to go on holiday to Italy and Greece and essentially wound down quite a lot of the time and just enjoyed socializing and discussing with their friends and spending time enjoying their lives after what was fleeing two wars mm. being in all this uh, horrendous state of affairs. And then in 1970, Aurel and Blucher are entertaining friends and he dies of a fatal heart attack, age 71. And after this point, Hannah Arendt's been keeping thinking journals for a whole life and they just stop mm. at this point. There's a couple of lists, but she, she finds herself withdrawing from the world again. Uh, like her best friend who had this, this amazing unconditional relationship with has gone and it feels like a part of has disappeared too as well. So Hannah Arendt becomes a citizen of the USA in 1950 and I think you can look at the 1950s and 60s as a really prolific time for her in terms of her philosophical growth. This is where she does the vast majority of her writing and writes the vast majority of her important books and works that come out obviously during this time. Um, obviously when you're on the run from war it's very hard to sit down and write a philosophical thesis. Uh, and as much as Jack's kind of just focused on very much with Blucher and, and the people in her life there, I think it's worth saying that you know Hannah Arendt was a very respectable university lecturer. She lectured all over America in places like Chicago and places like New York. And again, it's kind of weird, actually, very much like Heidegger. She's very, very well respected and very appreciated. And her students really liked her teaching style, mm. not to mention the movie again. But there's also some quite <laughs> cheesy moments in that movie where the students are looking at her with yeah. big wide and eyes. And really <laughs> cringy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, I think from well, at least the picture that you get from especially Samantha Rose Hill is that, yeah, I, I, I think some people were genuinely yeah. that enamored with her. Yeah, I put it really weirdly when I spoke about the police officer earlier, but she did have like an incredible way with people. She had good social skills and was apparently very charismatic, right? So who doesn't want a good teacher with who's charismatic with good social skills? I mean, not in my lessons personally, but <laughs> obviously for, for her, you know, that she had a very successful academic career, um, which I guess is come somewhat overshadowed by the controversy of the Banner mm. of Evil, which we'll get into later. This does overshadow much of her later work, but she was a very res respectful academic thinker um, a very um, her students thought very well of her uh, and I just want that I just want that to be really clear as well that obviously we're going through the end of her life quite quickly um, but she was uh, she had a very successful career in America and was an American citizen uh, through the 1960s and 70s on the back of all of her success she's invited to Aberdeen to give lectures and in 1974 uh, but she she essentially stands up to give the talk and she collapses doesn't she i mm. think she has a small heart attack there and then the following year in december 1975 she's entertaining friends again they'd ate she'd served them coffee in the living room while they were talking she starts coughing she sinks into a chair and loses consciousness and she dies shortly afterwards again from a heart attack over 300 mourners attend a funeral and she was buried next to Heinrich Blücher in the Brad College Cemetery in New York. Of course, one of the people who attended her funeral and, and actually read at her funeral was Mary McCarthy, which uh, unfortunately, be because there's so much content to to cover and, and so much about her life. Mary McCarthy, they had a, a, a bit of a difficult start to their relationship. They had a big fight and they, and they, they weren't friends. They met up again uh, later on and and hit it off and 
for the rest of their lives remained very much each other's confidants. And from my reading, it seems to suggest that she would actually go to Mary more often than she would do with Bluka with, mm. for certain things. Incredibly, incredibly close friend. And of course, even, even in the back of all of the Eichmann controversy, Mary McCarthy stuck by her and publicly mm. defended her mm. her interpretation of the trial and everything like that. So it's lovely that her, her, her close friend was available uh, and still alive at the time to be able to read at her wedding as well. No, sorry, damn it. Funeral. Why did I say wedding? Now I'm going to have to go back and do that entire thing. That's just, just say funeral <laughs> do no, not just do, no, no, no. <laughs> do it in a robot funeral oh, yeah, stupid. <laughs> <Brain>. um, <laughs> to be able to read at her funeral as well it is very difficult to describe just how much of an impact hannah arendt has had in certain areas of philosophy in history in social science yes of course the big controversy of the eichmann trial but all of her other work whether it's the human condition whether it's her reflections on other uh, academics and their lives at the time she was prolific Mm. and the people that knew her intimately we've already said kind of in awe of her thinking and her ability and perhaps that's why it was so difficult for certain people that when when she did bring about this controversy on herself that people found that very difficult that it was her that that they were having to to confront she now is considered i, I don't know I, I think this idea of the canon of western philosophy but she she is considered amongst the some of the greatest thinkers if not it, it, just in the 20th century but just across the whole of western mm. thought think about that for a minute just of of how much influence that that people will attribute to her we will talk a little bit more about her legacy in in later episodes but i think it's important just to say like if if you haven't really got that throughout the the stuff we've been talking about her her work was massive mm. I think it's worth mentioning as well, she's completely a thinker defined by the 20th century, that mm. as someone who had to literally flee, a uh, Jewish person fleeing World War II, uh, the horrors of the Holocaust, her work is really, really insignificant and important for many different people in many different political spheres and in many different parts of life. You know, you don't have to be a Jewish person to really appreciate Hannah Arendt's thinking. There's a, a universality to it and a really interesting, consistent thoughtfulness in a lot of her work that will really come about as we go into future episodes as well and just yeah we, we can't undersell it she is one of the most important thinkers of the 20th century in philosophy and you're going to understand why in the next couple of installments but for now it's going to remain a mystery welcome to a very tame version of mystery philosophy you're going to hear a quotation from a philosopher from the past and you've got to try and guess who this person might be never am i more active than when i am doing nothing never am i less alone than when i am by myself very relevant that quote as well, I feel it? like I've heard that before is that I, Schopenhauer it's not no I've definitely heard it because it's it comes it's definitely mentioned in it's one mentioned of, in one of the readings yeah beheaded this person was beheaded yeah 1006 to 43 it was Richard III 1006 no. BC to 43 oh, BC oh sorry no I was sorry I Roman know. lawyer Cicero. 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 Very yeah. good well done join us in a couple of weeks time where we'll be discussing the Eichmann trial and Hannah Rents book Eichmann in Jerusalem. It's already there on Patreon. We look forward to seeing you there.